Thank you uh, for the invitation to address you. Uh, I'm uh, sorry I could be there in person. I'm currently uh, out of the country and on vacation, but didn't want to miss the chance uh, to address so many professionals working in our natural resource areas. Thank you uh, for this invitation. Uh, I first want to start by saying um, the last few days I've, I've been away and taking care of myself, and I can't emphasize enough uh, how important it is, uh, given the pressures and, and everything that we deal with at such a high level, that we take the time to take care of ourselves. I was getting to a point where I was I barely getting through each and every day, and it was getting to be a struggle. And over the last two years, we've been tried and challenged more than any time in our life. And I think if we're going to continue to do the work that's important, that's in front of us, it's absolutely critical that we take the time, even if it's just a couple of days, uh, take the time and give yourself permission because we have an awful lot of work ahead of us. Uh, so having said that, uh, I just wanna say um, some of the highlights and important points that I really wanna emphasize in this address uh, has to do with the crisis that we're facing uh, with, with regard to climate change. Uh, those who, who know me know I've been working on this issue for a very long time. Uh, early in my presidency at the Quinault Nation, I, I could see what was happening to our natural resources at home, uh, to our salmon stock. And, and I learned about things like ocean acidification, uh, the melting glacier, we had to declare multiple states of emergency. And this last summer, we witnessed uh, temperatures that reached 111 degrees. And I physically saw the trees in our area just get singed on the, on the stand. And it was quite quite frightening. And those are things that we knew were ahead of us when we began to do our climate work. Uh, but as each year unfolds, we're realizing just the extent by which our natural resources are directly impacted. Uh, and we also realize that tribal nations were on the front lines of climate change. We're the most impacted, we're disproportionately impacted. And we've been able to secure some funding, but uh, over the last month, I've had a chance to meet with our council, with our staff, and I've come to find out we, we don't even have the resources close enough to begin to even understand the impacts of climate change to our community. Uh, we, we don't even know how uh, we're going to address adaptation strategies, mitigation strategies without knowing what the problem is. And so we're working right now to, to try to assess the capacity, need, capacity needs that we have just to understand the impacts of climate change. And, a story all too familiar to those of you that have been working within and with ITC for decades know the IFMAT reports over years have signaled an alarm that we're chronically underfunded, that we're desperately underfunded. And as these impacts of climate change become more intense and more frequent, we're losing our ability to even begin to do the necessary work to, to adapt to climate change. And so some of the things that I'm gonna be working with uh, our Quinault Council, as well as the work that I do as president of the National Congress of American Indians is to ensure that we're able to achieve a level of funding sufficient to even just have capacity to understand these needs. I think we need to be very strategic and aggressive, relying on the IFMAT reports, reports like uh, the US Commission on Civil Rights that detailed every federal agency is chronically underfunding Indian country. And we're not even at a base level of resources necessary to take care of our communities. So I think it's very important right now that we, we really focus on how we can take all of the work that we've done, all of the analysis and figure out a legal strategy and a political strategy because we're running out of time. And I'm just afraid that as uh, the impacts of climate change become more intensified and as the US is spending its dollars, not on dealing with climate change, but just on the symptoms of climate change, things like mega fires, tornadoes, and hurricanes, we're not even able to get to, to a, a basic level of managing our natural resources in a way that tribes have long known we need to manage, letting science drive our decision, letting a, a full understanding of natural resource value to our communities, not just as a resource for economic value, but as a resource for culture and, and for just maintaining our identity as, as native people. So. It's so important right now that going into this ITC, we really figure out how we can work together to uh, establish and, and execute a strategy that's gonna secure the resources that are minimally necessary. Because if we don't, 
we're going to continue to fall further and further behind. Uh, during this last um, strategy meeting we had with our Quinault Council here just a few weeks ago, it, it occurred to me, and I, I mentioned to our council, I, I vividly remember being in a briefing of the BIA when there were uh, negotiations around the fiscal cliff. And I remember at that time, Interior agreed to take on the, the major hit that would come to Interior's budget as discretionary funding was slashed. And I remember in, in that moment in hearing that announcement that while the Bureau is taking those cuts, to what degree are we gonna lose services? And it wasn't long after that, that we began to see uh, vacancies occur at, at a superintendent level. We, we saw early buyouts for retirement and we saw a shrinking uh, of the, the institutional knowledge and longevity of, um, uh, of uh, staffing and just knowledge for how our trustee is to manage our resources with tribal nations. And that cre has created a significant barrier for us. And at Quinault, we're, we're starting to find that uh, federal functions are now being performed by Quinault and, and being required to be performed by Quinault, but yet we didn't receive the corresponding funding. So we're further absorbing and subsidizing the federal trust responsibility to conduct federal actions. And again, without the resources to even begin to address things like climate change is, is very problematic. So I think we need to really understand and, and be aggressive in how we address funding to just perform our basic functions and to hold our trustee accountable for those functions that are, are part of longstanding agreements. And so that's the first point I really wanted to emphasize with, with everyone at this session. We're at a critical time. We don't have the resources the world is getting worse in terms of climate related impacts and we have to become resilient and strong and, and rely on not only new and emerging science, but our traditional ecological science. And so it's so important that we have those conversations at this session. The second point I, I really wanted to talk about was just to, to thank all of those that have been working so diligently in, in these fields. and. When I think about our staff at, at the Quinault Nation and uh, folks like Dr. Gary Marshima um, and our, our council, longstanding council that have been at the table, it's a, it's a reminder that we have inherited a rich legacy of work of those that have gone before us. Um, the tribal leadership, even within my own tribe, that goes back decades in, in understanding the vision of ITC and continuing to build on that. And I think it's very important for us to, to really stop and reflect on that history and the purpose and the vision and why we came together to form the Intertribal Timber Council, but also at the same time looking to the future. And uh, for those of you, it might be your first ITC meeting, you might be a young professional, you might be right at a college, but you're part of a, a long history. And we definitely have a vision for where we want to go as tribal nations and managing our natural resources. So we're working on a full spectrum of, of issues that have a long-standing history, but we certainly have a vision long into the future into how we want to manage our resources. And so I think it's very important for us uh, as we undertake the work to continue to, with purpose and with intention, reflect on those values that drew tribal leaders together to form ITC on the, the, the vision that we have for how we want to work not only within our own nation, but intertribally uh, through ITC, and that we embrace that, that history and we work together to not only achieve the vision and goals that those that have gone before us have set forth, but how are we going to build on that? How are we going to become more resilient? How are we going to ensure that ITC survives long into the future? Because we need uh, ITC to continue to manage the resources at such a critical time. Uh, the third and, and final point I, I really wanted to address is looking at um, beyond uh, ITC and, and looking at the future that we have. Uh, what are, are some of the solutions that we need to, to come together uh, to, to think about strategically? I've been very concerned, not only about the funding level and the failure of our trustee to honor commitments and the lack of our ability to, to even begin to understand and assess the current challenges facing our natural resources. 
But if we are going to effectively advocate, whether it's legislation, whether it's uh, at an administrative level with new rules that we need to adopt uh, to implement key pieces of legislation that we might achieve, but that we, we do so in a way that embraces and stands on our inherent sovereign authority and powers. And as I mentioned, we need to consider the, the basic fundamentals and values upon which ITC was built. Tribal sovereignty is one of those key values that our leaders that have gone before us really embraced and felt with everything in them. And I know everyone at the, the uh, at ITC this week shares that same value when, when it comes to our ability to manage our own resources without external interference that's something that we all not only uh, see and, and appreciate but we value to to a degree there's some flies here <laughs> to the to the degree that we need to and so uh there there's a principle that i've been advancing not only here in the state of washington and nationally but internationally and that's free prior and informed consent. And, and that's basically a, a principle that no other sovereign can take unilateral action affecting our land, territories, and resources. Now, I've been advocating for this principle for well over a decade, maybe a decade and a half. And I just got to the point here recently that I'm done asking. I'm done asking states. I'm done asking um, you know, Congress and agencies to implement and adopt FPIC. We don't need their permission. We possess that as an inherent right of ours. And we simply need to step into that and exercise it the way our tribal leaders have gone before us have, have long sought. And, and the question isn't, are you going to adopt it? The question is, how are you going to implement it? We possess it. How are you going to honor and respect basic principles of tribal sovereignty? And I'm confident that as we move into uh, th this era of truth and reconciliation and empowerment that tribal nations are going to not only lead in terms of climate policy, but lead in, in a, a addressing the critical issues facing our generation. Because when we look to the core values upon which our nations were built, uh, values that, that respect the natural world, values that honor the natural world in a way that protects it for, for millennia and for generations to come, there's no question that when we are guided by those ancient, timeless, and proven values and principles, we are going to be those areas within a country where you can go from glacier to ocean, like at Quinault, and see no development and see pristine areas. When you see an aerial photo of Wisconsin, you can see Oneida, you, you can see a rectangular forest, and all the brown, dark areas around the country are areas with a lot of pollution and degradation. But when you look inside Indian country, you see good solid science and traditional ecological knowledge and values and principles that have protected our lands for millennia and are gonna to continue to protect them. So I just ask that each and every one of you, as you do reflect on, on the purpose of ITC and you reflect on, on the values that we all share, when we collectively do that in a way that honors those that have gone before us with a clear vision for ensuring that our landscape is protected for generations to come. We can't go wrong. So um, I, I hope I shared uh, some thoughts with you. It's it's really humid here and I'm starting to feel like I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm done with the remarks I wanted to say, but I, again, didn't wanna pass up this opportunity. Uh, I wish I was there in person, and I'm, I'm so very honored and grateful to be invited to participate, even if it's recorded and even if it's virtually. But just know, uh, next time I see each and every one of you, I'm, I'm just going to be so thankful and grateful that we've had this time, and uh, best wishes, and have an excellent conference. Thank you. See you up well.